Welcome to the Clemson Dubcast Friday, November 12th edition. Clemson getting ready for what we think is going to be a breather, a rare breather, 2021 against UConn at TigerIllustrated.com. Right now, plenty of football coverage, but also great perspective from Paul Strilo on the transfer portal amid all the criticism, some of it justified, of the reluctance to use the portal. Strilo voice of reason that he is goes back and looks at okay what names or players were actually available at the time kind of important part of the conversation if we want to have a fair-minded conversation about Clemson's approach to the portal past present and future my good friends Blake Smith and Brooke Archenhold have been part of the podcast since the beginning way back in August of 2018 they have an accomplished team of personal injury attorneys at Parm Smith and Archenhold based in Greenville they are Clemson people and their skillful attorneys have decades of experience in complicated litigation matters taking a special interest in medical malpractice nursing home abuse and neglect car accident cases that have left the individuals involved in serious trouble for a free consultation at Parm Smith and Archenhold call 864-990-4 4581 or online at parhamlaw.com. That's P A R H A M law.com. Solero Communications, formerly known as Tandem Payment, is a full service integrated electronic payments provider powered by leading edge technology. Solero provides a wide array of merchant solutions, simplified payments. They make onboarding, taking payments, maintaining risk management and compliance, and getting support quick and easy. At Solero, they're all about helping you achieve sustainable growth as a business. Taking payments isn't the only thing your business needs. With Solero's solutions, you can manage inventory, sell products and services via social media, schedule staff, track sales, get reports, and much, much more. Find out more about Solero at solerocommerce.com. That's C-E-L-E-R-O commerce.com. When you're ready for a complete renovation in your home or business, open the door to more with Harris Home and Harris Commercial. Their local experience team will totally transform any room space from beautiful floor coverings to construction to finish details. Harris handles every step of your renovation process, whether it's a kitchen or living room or an industrial or educational setting, like some of the positively stunning work they've done at Clemson University. Go to discoverharris.com and experience a total renovation transformation from Harris Home and Harris Commercial. Okay, to our interview with Lindell Zanders, father of Landon Zanders. Less than three weeks ago, they lost the home that Lindell built, I guess 20 years ago in Shelby, North Carolina. Wonderful perspective that this man has after such a traumatic event. He came away from it, not devastated, but eternally grateful that he still has his two boys. All right, here we go. Enjoy. Okay, joined by Lindell Zanders, father of Landon Zanders. How you doing, sir? All right. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well, and... Sorry that the occasion for this conversation is 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 uh, you know something so difficult that that you and your family have gone through and uh, but appreciate you you joining and and hopefully we can bring more awareness to um, to what happened and also some maybe immediate support in the form of a GoFundMe page that that y'all have set up for things that uh, that insurance doesn't get to soon enough so I guess I, am I putting that the right way. Yes, sir. Um, I appreciate you reaching out to me. Yeah, and uh, insurance, you know, it's, it's slow like everything else in life now. With the COVID and stuff, you know, it's, it's just a slow process, and we haven't even really begun to get started on it yet. Uh-huh. And what, um, I guess if you could just uh, take me back to, uh, you know, for people who, who, aren't aware of of what happened or maybe have just heard sort of in passing uh, about about what happened i guess we'll just start start from the beginning and 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 share how how you and how the you know you ended up losing your house all right so um i believe it was october 24th is when our house uh burnt down so like a week before that or maybe two weeks, I had to have uh, emergency surgery. Um, I had like a hernia. And for what I understand, I, I work out a lot. So I let it go too long, and it kind of got like infected. Mm. Don't know how. So I went to the ER, and uh, within three hours, I was in, a, in emergency surgery. So 
during the healing process, I was at home for about a week. And then the weekend our home caught on fire, I went down to uh, Merle's Inlet which is in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, just to get away. Um, the doctor said I was okay to ride in the back of the car. So I went to the beach, uh, just a different scenery. And so Landon had come home because that's when Clemson was pay- playing, I believe, Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Pitts. And so he come home. Um, I was headed to the beach that Friday, and he was coming home that Friday. And so... I seen on our phones, me, Landon, and my oldest son, Quentin, Landon's brother, who was at Western Carolina, we got GPS on each other. So we always know each other at, like, you know, if I'm at a restaurant or something, they'll be like, they'll text me like, daddy, bring me something home to eat or something. <laughs> or, you know, they keep up with me and I keep up with them. Yeah. So my, my phone went off and it said, you know, Landon Zanders arrived at home. I called him. I said, baby, what you doing at home? I said, I'm not even home this weekend. He was like, I know, I seen your GPS. I knew where you was going. He said, I just wanted to come home because I didn't travel with the team this week. He said, you know, I'll see Grandma and everybody, and I'll just chill out at home, and I'll see you Sunday when you get home. So, okay, that's fine. Weekend is going good, Friday and Saturday. And so Sunday morning at 4.25 a.m., my phone rang, and I seen, you know, Landon's name come up. And automatically, as a parent, you mm. know, when your phone rings that time of morning, something's not right. Yeah. You know, your heart drops. And, you, and I, I said it out loud. I said, something's wrong. Soon I asked the phone, I said, what's wrong, Landon? He, he was, you know, he was crying. He was upset. He was like, Daddy, the house is on fire. And so I got up. I said, what do you mean? He said, the house is on fire. I said, okay. I said, are you in the house? He said, no, sir, I'm outside. I said, are you burnt? Are are you hurt? He said, no, daddy, I'm okay. I said, did your brother come home this weekend? He said, no, he stayed at school, dad. So I said, well, long as you out of the house and you okay, I said, it's all right. I said, is the fire department on the way? He said, they already here. I said, well, baby, as long as you're okay and your brother didn't come home, I said, get out of the way. Let the fire department do what they do. I said, don't you dare go back in that house and try to save anything. And so he said, okay. And, you know, he was crying. He was upset like anybody would be. You sitting there watching your house burn. And I stayed on the phone with him the whole time while I'm packing the car up, like throwing my stuff in there to head back down the road. Because it's like a three-hour drive for me to get back to where we live at. So uh, I, I called my mom and told her, because she lives like 10 minutes away, and I said, Mom, the house is on fire. You know, go down there and be with Landon until I get home. So my mom and my brother, you know, went down there to, um, to be with them. And, and, and what's, what the amazing thing is how good God is. We serve an awesome God. He was in that house asleep and did not wake up until the fire department cut the power off to the house and the fan cut off. Yeah. And that's what woke him up. Like the fire department was already there undoing, you know, rolling out the hoses and stuff. And they went around to the side of the house and pulled the meter and the fan cut off. And he said he woke up when the fan cut off and he looked to the left because he was asleep in my room. When my boys come home, especially Landon, you know, he'll just take over my bed. So he, uh, he was in my room asleep and he said he woke up. And he seen flames, and the first thing he thought was, oh, man, my fire pit done started back up. Let me go outside and put it out. And he said he opened up my bedroom door, and smoke hit him in the face. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, God, you know, something on fire. So he was able to, you know, feel his way through the living room and get to the front door. He said he held his breath, and he got to the front door. And when he stumbled out the front door, the fire department was like, did you just come out of this house? It's like, yes, I just come out of this house. And it was like, oh, my God, is is anybody else in there? He's like, no, I'm the only one here. And they didn't even know he was in there. Yeah. Like, so it's, it's by the grace of God that he made it out. And, um, you know, all from a fire pit. So the investigator from the insurance company, the fire marshal, who— does this for a living. He told me he's been doing it for over 20 years. 
So he walked me through what happened. He showed me. So we had a fire pit in the backyard, which we use all the time. You know, that's something we do. We make memories there. We sit there and we, we talk to each other, you know, and I, I give my boys good life um, lesson points, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. good advice sitting by the fire pit. That's one of our favorite places to, to be at. You know, we get into deep conversation, talk about life and, and, and the things of life. And so the fire marshal, he walked me through what happened because I was confused about what happened. Like, man, how could a fire pit burn down a whole house? So he showed me where the fire pit was sitting. And under our back deck, we had a pretty big back deck. It was at least a, a 30 by 40, maybe. I mean, it was a huge back deck made out of wood. And um, he showed me, it, it, he said an emerald caught the grass on fire. And the grass caught the legs of the deck on fire, like the wooden posts that go mm-hmm. down into the ground. Caught them on fire. And then it just it caught the deck on fire. And the deck started burning up to the house. And once it got in the attic of the house, and that's what made us lose the whole house. They said once it got into the attic, you can't really stop it. Because everything up there is so dry. Uh-huh. And so that's what that's what happened. With, with the house burning down, you know, it was an accident. My son, and, and one thing I want to say while I'm, I'm talking to you is I've, I've read some stories about uh, one guy said, and this is what a guy wrote. He said, Clemson football player obsessed with fire accidentally burns down family home. I'm not going to say who he writes for, but his first name is Patrick. And I think that's obscene to say something like that. When, when you read that article, it automatically makes you think that like Landon was playing with a lighter or something, or he just set stuff on fire and he accidentally burned down the house. That is not what happened. A fire pit set our house on fire. So, you know, and, and some of the articles you know, just just didn't it didn't portray my son as what he is. My son has never played with fire. He's not a a fire bug or you know, I think the first person I talked to, you know, like two days after the fire happened, he uh I told him my son loves sitting by a fire pit. And what Landon does, and instead of going out and, and hanging out with friends when he come home, Landon will be like, Dad, I'm going to build a fire pit in a fire pit and sit outside. I'm like, okay, you know, go ahead. You know what to do. And that's what he loves to do. He just loves to sit. He's, a, he's an outdoors type of young man. He loves to be outside. And, and that's what he loves to do. And by me saying that, you know, they turned him into fire marshal bill. By me saying that he loves to, to sit outside with a fire, he loves to build a fire in a fire pit. A, a young man that loves to build a fire in a fire pit doesn't mean he's obsessed with fire. I've never had to get on to him like, don't play with fire. Don't no, we live by the woods. Like, we got woods near our house in the backyard and stuff. He's never set nothing on fire. He enjoys a fire pit. And so that kind of, that, that hurt me and it made me, it upset me for, you know, stories to get out like that, right there. At the end of the day, that's my son you're talking about and you, you're spreading false information about him. You, you're demeaning his character. And I didn't like that. And uh, the first guy that I talked to, you know, him and Landon talked after the story come out and, you know, they spoke with each other and everything's fine with them. But the, the one guy that named Patrick, I responded to him. He's never contacted me back. You mean so you re- Landon, you, yes, sir. You reached out to him like on a uh, uh, Twitter direct message or no, uh, I, I commented on the story he wrote. I see. And I put my name down and told him who I was and he, he not to respond yet. But the guy that wrote for Greenville, not Gr- Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Greenville. You know, him and Landon talking, Landon told him how the story made him feel, and the guy said, you know, it wasn't nothing like that. And he apologized. So, like, him and Landon have an understanding. There was a a, a misunderstanding, and and they both communicated with each other like grown men. 
And I admire Landon because he reached out and said, hey, you know, it made me feel like this. And that writer wrote back to Landon and, and they, you know, talked to each other. And I respect that. I have nothing respect. I have nothing but respect for that guy. You know, he reached back out to my son and explained things and and they're fine. So, you know, and that's, and that's what happened is it was an accident that could have happened to me. I could have been the one that lit the fire pit that night. And the embryos didn't go out when we, you know, when we thought they was out. It could have happened to anybody. Well, it's like, you know, my family, we, we enjoy, we have two fire pits behind our house. And if we are sitting out there one night and we go to bed and the wind blows and I don't know, we, we have a boat that's 20 feet away. And let's say the wind blows a spark and, and it blows the boat up. Uh huh. That doesn't mean I blew my boat up. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> or, or if the boat catches, then the catches the house on fire. That doesn't mean I burn my house down. Yeah. yeah and, that, and, and that's the way some people portrayed it. Like, and, and I, you don't know how many phone calls I got. And when people seen me, it was like, when they seen the story, it was like, this is bogus. Even my neighbor. Uh, so I, I was a single dad. I raised both my boys by myself uh, from like the time Landon was six months old. Me and their mother separated, which the, their mother's a great woman. So, you know, she understood that it take, takes a man to raise men. And so she allowed me to do that. And I commend her for that, you know, to let me raise the two boys and teach them how to be men. And so my neighbor would babysit my boys for me sometimes because I worked. Uh, third shift sometimes and when she seen the story she was so upset she said as many times I've babysitted your boys for you while you work she said your kids have never played with fire or, or burnt my house down or any she said why would they portray him like he's a fire starter I said, I said I don't know I said you know I have no idea why the titles and the headlines read like that and she was very upset. She said, I'm calling these people and, and they're going to do something about this because I've babysitted your boys many a times. They stayed the night at my house while you work with me and my husband was asleep. Nothing's ever happened to us. So there was a lot of people upset that Landon got portrayed as I like to say fire Marshall Bill, you know, from uh, in living color. Right. That's right. So, <laughs> and that's how I like to say they portrayed him as, and he's not that kid. Never has been. He's one of he's a he's a quiet kid. When he comes home, he doesn't want to go out. He really doesn't even let anybody know he's home. He just wants to relax and just you know be by himself, spend time with me and his brother. He's not the one to go out and 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 party and stuff like that. So he's he's just a, a different type of young man. He's very um, to himself. All right, I want to unpack sort of the media side of this, the journalistic, or I guess the lack thereof of, you know, journalism part of this. Uh -huh. And, and maybe some of this will be enlightening for you and helpful in sort of helping you and maybe others understand how something like that could happen uh, with, with, uh -huh. with it being portrayed as it was. Um, this really exposes what is wrong with, sort of the media or part of what's wrong with the way media goes about its business or sort of the business model, I guess you, I guess I should say yes, sir. But now versus say <clears throat> 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, something like this happens. You're contacted by three or four reporters who cover Clemson on a daily basis, uh -huh. newspaper guys, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, Gr Greenville plus Columbia plus Charleston plus Spartanburg, I, I guess, just hypothetically. Yes, sir. And they they directly contact you and or Landon to report the story. Yes, sir. And then they turn around and write their stories, and then maybe the television news picks up on that, uh, or maybe the you know t television reporters also contact you, and and so they're it's direct reporting, I guess is probably the best way uh -huh. 
best way to put it. The way this happened is uh, you, you were contacted by one reporter, right? That being, it was Todd, yep. Todd Shaughnessy of the Greenville News, who, like you said, is a stand-up guy, cover, yeah. covers Clemson on a daily basis. He, yes, he he is not perfect, you know, like reporters make mistakes, but the important part, which you emphasized, is that he said, you know what, I'm sorry, I, you know, I didn't, you know, maybe I misconstrued yeah. something that... But he owned up to it, and that's the that's the most important part, which left you with nothing but respect for him. <clears throat> but the, pro- but respect for him. The, the problem, it's a huge problem, is I, I've got the Google search right in front of me on my computer screen, Landon Zander's fire. There are tons of results that pop up, uh-huh. tons of headlines. Only one of those headlines are from the actual news outlet and reporter that did the original reporting, the only reporting that's it. And so the rest, Uh the rest of the headlines are all from people who took that one piece of reporting, original reporting and put their sort of own spin on it, did zero reporting on their own. That's the issue Uh is that. And so then you have a guy, you said his name's Patrick, you said you didn't want to. You, did, you said you didn't want to name the website, but it's. It's. I think I need to name it just to sort of emphasize the point here. It's from Fan Sided, which that. That's not a an outlet. That's not a reporter that covers Clemson. Uh, that's actually here physically. It's some guy, who's sitting on his couch somewhere, uh-huh. and who, basically surfs social media and 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 the internet and sees a story and then creates his own story off of that. And, and the headline, the, the business model these days is built on the clickbait. I guess you've probably heard, heard that. Like yes. what's going to be the most clickable, what's going to make people click on this. Uh huh. And the more clicks you get, the more money you get. I don't know how much money. I mean, I don't know. I would guess maybe this reporter, who knows? I just a, I have no idea what the figures are, but maybe he made a hundred dollars instead of twenty dollars. Yeah. You know, uh, by cre- saying that, by writing that headline. But Clemson football player obsessed with fire accidentally burns down family home, and then you have a, a, a lot of other headlines or out- websites too. None of which actually cover Clemson, so they don't have a res- they don't feel sort of an inherent responsibility to get it right Uh it's more i'm going to spend 10 minutes rewriting this story and then i'm going to come up with a headline to make it kind of sensational and then i'm going to go about you know writing 10 other stories that day you know so there's not Uh the attention to detail and the sort of care that is required when you're doing real journalism which is what you said that the original reporter from the Greenville News did in that, yes. in that he actually reached out to y'all, and then on top of that, when when Landon pointed out to him, hey, that this particular passage, I, I didn't really feel right from that. Instead of being a, instead of ignoring Landon uh, or saying, you know, being condescending and saying, well, you know, we're telling it, you know, we're not backing down or we stand by our story or whatever, he apologized uh-huh. and anyway. He did, and, and that, that's why I have so much respect for him. But th- this is a this is a major problem because so many people are on social media. So many people, you know, when they hear that Land has been in a fire, what's the first thing they type in? Land and Xander's fire, and what are the things that pop up? Like the people who don't know him, exactly, and who don't know better, then their sort of opinion of him is shaped by yes, all this just whack job stuff that's being written about him. Yeah. So I apologize and, on behalf of 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 just the media in general that this that something like this can take that type of turn to the point where the victims are 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 then on top of dealing with something enormously difficult, losing a house, are then ha- have to then deal with with, with this type of stuff being written. So it's, it's really, really, really unfortunate. It's, it's, it's a sad state of what we live in of, of how the world operates now. It's like 
bad news is what they want. Like they just want to spread awful stuff because it sells. Yeah. And and to do something like that, people don't understand. Like our house burnt completely down. The only thing that's standing at the home we built and and that we've lived in for almost the last twenty years is the front part that was made out of brick. Mm. My my two boys lost every single thing they've ever had except for their lives and the little bit of clothes they got at college. That's it. They lost everything. Pictures, all the, their their trophies and awards and and elementary awards and, and you know, everything. And then you go and write a story like that. You know, Landon already feels bad enough. You know, he's hurt. You know, the, it you know, this our house burnt down and you know, I remember him telling me like, you know, I'm so sorry, Daddy, you worked so hard like to build this house for us and you give us everything we ever wanted and is and it's burning to the ground. And for him to feel like that and then to have to go read stories like this, it's like a slap in the face, man. It, you know? Yeah. Society just it, it doesn't care. And it's awful. You know, and 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 I'm so grateful and I praise and I, I've had a good attitude about this whole situation. I, I didn't like the way they portrayed my youngest son. But as far as my house burning down and I've had a real good positive attitude about it, because at the end of the day, like I told Landon when we was on the phone and I was traveling home, as long as you made it out of there, son, I don't give a crap about that house or anything that's in there. Because when I hug you and I'm a dad and I'm always kissing on my boys, you know, kiss them on the cheek and stuff. And, and we, we just, we're, we're, the three of us are just, we love each other so much. I said, the feeling I get from you, I can't get from that house. Like when I hug you and I tell you, I love you and you, you know, you tell me that back, I can't get from that house. So don't you be upset about this house. It was an accident. It happened. There's nothing we can do about it now, but love each other and rebuild. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to continue to love each other, trust in God, and he's going to see us through this. And we're going to rebuild. And if I come up short with money and stuff, hey, we're fine. I, I got a job. I've been at the same company for 22 years. So I'm not afraid to work. And, and we're going to make it through this. It's just the stories they wrote about my son hurt me the worst. It hurt me worse to read them articles than it did for me to lose everything mm, I've worked wow. for. It hurt me that bad. What was the what was that drive home like from Earl's Inlet? Oh <laughs> really? It started out hectic. But then, you know, the spirit fell upon me and, and God was just, he, he was telling me, you know, you, you've lost a home, a house that you built, but a home is where you make it. And I can, I knew when I got home to, to where we lived at, my son was going to be there. Like he had and went to, you know, he had done left the scene of the house and, and went to uh, my fiance's house. But I knew when I got there, I was going to be able to hug him, kiss him, squeeze him, tell him I love him. And, and that's all I cared about at that time. And still to this day, when I, when I leave work, I go to that house every day. And we, we got a bench that sits out front, you know, like one of them decorating benches with the bird bath mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. I go there every day and I sit outside of that burnt down house and just thank God that my youngest son made it out. Every day I go by that house and sit on that bench and I walk around it and look into, you know, look at all the destruction and stuff. And I just thank God that I'm able to still kiss Landon and love on him. And, and my oldest son didn't come home from Western Carolina because they had a game. And, you know, he's playing and playing football there. And I'm just, I'm so thankful that I still have both of my boys. My boys are my world. They the reason I get up every morning and go to work and work hard because of them. 
they are the reason I'm the man I am today because of them. And anybody that knows me can tell you that knows Lindell Zanders knows that his boys are his world. I ask God often, why in the world did you trust the old ratchet center like me with these two amazing kids? Why did you bless me with these boys? I can't wrap my, I can't wrap my head around it. Like why would God give me something so special? And he, and he did. And I thank him for that. So the situation is, it, it is what it is. I'm grateful. I don't think I've shed a tear about losing my home yet. I've shed tears of praise because I still have both of my children. And I feel like as long as I got them, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I tell people all the time, I can live in a cardboard box on the side of the street as long as I got my two kids and they're safe. Material stuff doesn't matter to me. I, I, I've been through a lot this year. I had open heart surgery the wow. first of this year. And then, you know, I had this emergency operation and then the house burns down. And, and really, when I had that open heart surgery at 42 years old, I'm, I'm pretty healthy. I work out four days a week. I run, you know, and I, I had a condition that I was born with and never knew it my whole life. 42 years, God has allowed me to live with this condition with my heart. And so I had a, I was born with a hole in my heart. And mo- everybody is, but theirs closed up. Mine didn't close up. Mine got bigger as I got older. Like, as my heart grew, the hole grew. And it was causing me health issues for a long time. And we never could figure out what was causing my health issues. And, you know, something happened. I had, like, a mini stroke in my sleep. And so I went to the hospital, and they ran all kind of tests on me, and they come back and said, Mr. Zanders, you have a hole in your heart. Like, we have to ship you to Levine's in uh, Charlotte. You got to have open-heart surgery. And that right there kind of really, really opened my eyes about how short life is and that it's not about material stuff. It's about love. It's about forgiveness. It's about helping when you can help. It's about just doing for others when you can do it. I'm a, I'm a person, and I can talk forever, but I'm not. I'm a, I'm a guy, I tell everybody I love them. Like, at work, they, we was talking about that about this this week at work. Everybody like, Linda, you always tell people you love them. I say, because I do. I said, just telling somebody you love them, you can change their whole outlook on life that day. Just saying, hey, I love you, brother. Mm. I love you, sis. That's all it takes is to say, I love you, or, you know, how are you doing? You, you, you having a great day? And that's something society doesn't do anymore. You don't meet a stranger and, and you're like, how you doing, sir? And, and open the door for somebody and say, you know, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, ma'am. Just doing something like that, man, can really change somebody's day. And that's the way I try to live. And this whole fire and God blessing me to still have both of my boys Man, I tell you what, brother, I'm one happy man. I am very happy, even though I've I've lost my house and everything in it, man. But I I, I smile every day. You know, the things that mean the most to me are, are still here, and and that's how I feel about the situation. And I'm thankful and I'm grateful, and for everybody that's reached out to the GoFundMe uh, to help with the cost of of the house, that insurance is, won't cover everything. You know, the, the Clemson parents, uh, football parents, James, I, I'm normal murder his last name, Skowalski. So Skowski, yeah. Skowski. Mm-hmm. His mother started uh, taking up donations, like, soon as it happened. And KJ's Henry mother, like, from the parents of the football players, man, and they raised money and – Gave it to me at the, I think it was the Florida State game, you know, and we got in a prayer circle and it was like, we know you said you don't, you know, really want help and stuff, but we took it upon ourselves and, and we reached out to the parents of the football players. Man, they took up a donation for me. That was amazing. It blew me away. My uh, company I worked for, when it happened, they set up a GoFundMe page to raise $10,000. And it raised $10,000 in like four days. Mm. 
I was like, oh my God. And then my sister set me up a GoFundMe page, my baby sister. That's what I'm living with right now. I stay with her and my fiance, like back and forth. So she set up one because the, the one my company set up, when it reached 10,000, they went ahead and corporate rules or something, they disabled it. So my sister set up one. She said, well, here's, I'll set you up one. If anybody else want to help you, because you got a long road to go. And so uh, just the love I've received from everybody. I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Uh, Coach Dabo, he's called a hundred times. Uh, Coach Mickey Kahn, he called me so much. I was like, if Coach <laughs> Kahn called me one more time, I'm going to block his number. <laughs> and, and Coach Venables, you know, everybody sees Coach Venables as this crazy guy on the sideline yelling. And, but no, he called, you know, make sure it was okay. He called Landon. I mean, every time I turned around, one of the coaches was on the phone with Landon. Our coach, Mickey Kahn, was calling me. And I was like, Coach Kahn, we're good. He's like, I'm just checking. <laughs> he, he called back a little bit later. Like, we okay. And it's just it's the love you get from, from Clemson and the coaches and the parents of them football players, it, it blew my mind. It let me know that there's still hope for this world. You know, them people don't know me. I'm, I'm one of the parents that I kind of sit in the back and I don't, you know, I don't know a lot of the parents. I, I just support my kid and, and, and do what I can do. And, and for them to reach out like that and, and bless me with a donation and stuff, man, it speaks highly of, of the Clemson family. So, I love Clemson. Did it sort of confirm to you that when Landon chose Clemson, that he was choosing not just a, a football team, but a culture and a, like the family that you, that you referenced? Yes, I am. I am so glad that my son, you know, uh, I was leaning towards another school. You, you going to name <laughs> it? I'm not going to name it, but <laughs> I was leaning towards another school. Like I was gun ho for this school. Like, oh man, let's go. Why can't you name it? <laughs> uh, Tennessee. <laughs> I was good. I was like, man, I just, I just love Tennessee. But then when we got that visit to Clemson and and I guess just the way they do things. And i tell you what really sold me on Clemson, Coach Mickey Kahn. I mean, that's – and Dabo's a great man too, but Coach Kahn, he he just has that that godly vibe about him. Like, I kind of felt like when I was giving landing to him, it's kind of like handing him over to another dad. Like, okay, I'm his dad here, but Coach Kahn's going to be his dad. Uh, when he goes to Clemson, and mm-hmm. and uh, and when when Coach Dabo and and Coach Venables and Coach Khan and one more coach come and ate dinner with us, you know, when they was recruiting Landon, that kind of sold me because it wasn't a rush. Like they went in there an hour. Coach Dabo and them sat in our house like four hours to the point where I was like, okay, who wants it to go play? <laughs> it's time for y'all to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew it. It was genuine people. Like they wasn't rushing. There's like I'm like, dude, it's going on ten o'clock. It's time for y'all to go home. Get out. And that's how I kind of ended their visit. Was like, okay, who wants us to go, boss? <laughs> you had to... <laughs> like, yeah, it's time for y'all to go because they just they was just talking and talking and talking and staying and laughing and eating and. And that kind of sold me, man. I was like, man, this is, and I tell Landon all the time now, I said, baby, I'm glad this is the one time you didn't listen to your dad <laughs> and you did what you felt was right. I said, you made the right decision. And he did. So, he, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Did. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt Yeah, you. go ahead. I was going to say a mutual friend of ours, uh, Lisa Jackson, mm-hmm. who was, uh, uh, great lady yeah wonder, wonderful lady. sweet woman uh, yes. from, from that area shelby uh-huh. um like she posted i guess a few days after <clears throat> the fire she posted on tiger illustrated which i think you're a member of uh, yes I am. yeah thank you yeah um but she posted that uh one of the one of the sort of the kick in the gut insurance wise is that you you had insurance, but the adjuster was brutally honest in that he he told you that right now 
we're in such a seller's market that it's not a good time to build a house or to have one burned down. Yes, <laughs> yes, he will get insurance, but the cost of building another house would be triple the cost given all the yes. weird circumstances yep. that we're in. So is am I missing anything? Is that pretty much what he said? Yeah, that's what he said. And, and, and he was a real – I mean, everybody I've met through this whole process through my insurance company have been – amazing people they're 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 nice and they're understanding and and they let my son know my youngest son hey we've seen this a million times young man don't be hard on yourself you ain't the first to do it and you won't be the last to do it like something like this to happen an accident he said we've seen it a million times but he told us he said this is not the time to buy a house or to burn one down (laughs) because say in 2001 my house was two hundred thousand dollars to get built now it'll be four fifty, almost mm-hmm. half a million dollars for a two hundred thousand dollar house because of the price of of material and lumber. Yeah, and so I I might have to come out of pocket a little bit, you know, thirty forty thousand dollars, and I'm okay with that. You know, like I say, I work every day. I've worked at the same company since I was nineteen years old. I've always worked, and so I'm fine with that. But would I like to be able to? not have to finance more money for a house that was almost paid for in like 10 years, my house would have been paid for. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, I would like to not have to add on another $40,000 or something to the current loan. But if I do at the end of the day, I got both of my kids. We're all healthy and I'm loving life. You know, people tell me, um, they said, Linda, you've had a hard year this year, man. You, you've been through it. And, and I stopped him. I said, no, I ain't had a hard year. I've had a great year. I've had a blessed year. I said, because everything that's happened to me has been fixable. My heart condition is fixable. I feel like I'm 20 years old now. My knees and stuff still hurt. You know, I still got bad joints. But my heart, I feel like a 20-year-old kid, a 15-year-old. And the emergency hernia surgery I had to have, it's, it's fine. Like, I'm back to normal. My house burns down with my youngest son in it, and he makes it out without a scratch on him. I said, you can't say that's a bad, that's a great year. That's an amazing, that's a God-given year. So I'll take that any day. How often do you think of the fan and just sort of shudder? Like, that's what, his, that's what saved his life, them turning the power off and the fan turning off. Oh man, I I I don't know. Oh, uh, I get emotional when I think about what could have happened. You know, yeah. I, it is is I do, man. I think about what could have happened, and I'm just so grateful it played out the way it did. If if you could see the destruction of that house, and when I say it's nothing left in that house, it's nothing. The only thing. Let me let me let me back up. The only thing, and I know this is God given. The only thing that didn't burn up, I had uh, one of my master bedroom closets. The door was shut, and and that's where we had a little file cabinet. And my sons, both of my sons, like their birth certificate, social security card, passports, and stuff, was in that file cabinet. And I had one big box of pictures from them growing up. Uh, when they was little, they played. Um, Little league football, and, and we play upward soccer, upward baseball, upward basketball. I had one box of pictures that didn't burn up, and it was a good bit of pictures. And and that's the only thing in that house that didn't burn up because that closet door was shut. It kept the fire and the smoke out of there. And Landon's um, when he went to the national championship game in 2019, and the when they played Ohio and the uh, ACC jerseys, that did not burn up. And my oldest son's Western Carolina game jerseys didn't burn up. One closet mm. with some of the most important stuff in it. And yeah. I, was, I was thinking, like, man, my, both my boys' jerseys. And I was just getting ready to, like, hang them up in the, uh, in the living room, like put them on the wall. And I'm so thankful that I didn't because they would have they burnt up then. But they was in that closet packed away and they did not get one one scratch on them. Hmm. 
not 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 fire, not water. That one closet is the only thing in my house that didn't burn to the ground. And I'll say the the thing that I lost that I do wish I could have the one thing besides the health of my kids is I was always that dad that I kept a video camera with me. Like if they was doing something, I was recording it from when they was babies mm. all the way through high school. And so I lost all of that footage. I had hundreds and hundreds oh, of, of tapes and Sims cards and, um, during Christmas, I would I used to set the video camera up on a tripod. We go out, we find us a real Christmas tree, and bring it back to the house. And I set the tripod up with the camera cord on it, and put the Christmas tree up. And I would sit on the couch and let them decorate the tree. I mean, this is when they was four, five, six. Could you imagine how that tree looked? <laughs> it was pretty awful. <laughs> I think we had the ugliest Christmas tree <laughs> in America. They would have stuff just on one side, and they went nothing but three foot tall did. Just the bottom of it was decorated. I mean, it was probably the, the worst Christmas tree ever, but I let them do that every year. I would set the camera up and record it. And what's amazing, you could see the progress of the tree getting better and better the older they got. Mm-hmm. And it's stuff like that. That's probably the most valuable thing I will want back. It's yeah. just all because, you know, I plan on showing their kids. Like, look at yeah. your dad. Look what they've done. And, you know, I don't have that anymore, but we're going to make more memories. I'm, I'm going to get a new camcorder. So I'm going to just be recording them as young grown men that they are now. So I'm, I'm very happy and I'm very thankful, sir. Football season is grilling season, and Jack Oliver's Pool Spa and Patio is South Carolina's premier source for the big three. Weber, Traeger, and Big Green Egg Grills. Blackstone Griddles, too. I'm Jack Oliver. Grill all your tailgate favorites to perfection with a premium gas, charcoal, or pellet grill, then top it all off with something sizzling from your Blackstone Griddle. For grills, griddles, patio furniture, hot tubs, and saunas, shop in store or online at Jack Oliver's Pool Spa and Patio, Forest Drive in Columbia, and jackoliverpools.com. If you're in the Eastern Midlands and PD area and you're in any way interested in buying and selling a home, commercial property, land, need to consider reaching out to Uptown Realty. They're based out of Sumter and run by a friend of mine, Patrick Enzer, big Clemson guy, used to cover the Tigers in a newspaper capacity, longtime supporter of Tiger Illustrated, longtime listener to the Dubcast. The home buying process should be an enjoyable experience, so let Patrick and his staff do all the heavy lifting. All you got to do is pick up the phone and call 803-774-0435 or go to UptownRealtySC.com. Want to share a quick word about Founders Federal Credit Union? If you've been to a sporting event in Clemson, you've probably heard about Founders already. They are the official credit union partner of the Clemson Tigers. In addition to that, all Clemson faculty, staff, and students are eligible for membership as well as IPTA members. Matt Gross is a proud Clemson alum and the vice president for the Clemson market for Founders Federal Credit Union. Matt's office is located beside the Walmart neighborhood market on Old Greenville Highway in Clemson. For more information, go to foundersfcu.com. Another loyal supporter of the Dubcast is Blackacre Law Firm in Greenville, a subsidiary of Parm, Smith & Archenthal. Blackacre helps South Carolina residents achieve their dreams of home ownership by providing experienced professional representation for real estate closings. Attention to detail is crucial in real estate law. Blackacre is committed to making sure nothing gets by them preparing residential or commercial closings. Blackacre also offers estate planning services for their clients in the Greenville area. Find out more about Blackacre at 864-326-350 zero seven what what does like there were some practical things you know like i guess landon's car keys melted and then yep. your other sons uh, i guess all of his winter clothes were, were in the house uh it, it, from what i read i don't is that accurate like so there or were things that sort of immediate practical uh, uh things that needed to be that were lost that, yes. that needed to be replaced and, and um yeah so my my oldest son his name is quentin T- Quentin Zanders, mm-hmm. he uh he goes to Western Carolina. He plays football. He's running back at Western Carolina. So his apartment's not as big as Landon's. So he, like, during the summer, he has his summer clothes up there. And then when it gets ready to turn winter, he'll bring his summer clothes home and take his winter clothes back. And just so happened, Landon was going to take all of Quentin's winter clothes to Clemson 
and Quint was just going to come to his brother's apartment and get him that same weekend, which it never happened. So I had to go, you know, and buy Quentin all new winter clothes because the coldness in Western is a lot different than the coldness in Clemson and Kings Mountain. Like it's yeah. the, it is freezing up there. So I had to go and uh, you know, and I took Landon with me. He he knows these young, he know what they like and stuff. So I had to go buy him a whole new winter watch. I mean, new jackets, pants, uh, hoodies, boots. You know, I spent a good bit of money just getting him new winter clothes because he had no winter clothes. I mean, he still had just shorts and stuff up there. So that was one immediate thing that I had to get right then and there. And I took it up to him as soon as we went and got it. I took it up there to him. You what? know, and Landis car keys, they mailed, you know, all the car keys and stuff. Yeah. But that's one thing we had to purchase right then and there because my oldest son, he said he was freezing his butt off at Western. <laughs> so, what did they, what, uh, what did they lose that they, that they missed the most uh, from the fire? Um, I would, I would say Quentin, my oldest son, he was an elite wrestler. Like he holds the record right now in Cleveland County for the most wins in high school with, when it comes to wrestling. Mm -hmm. So he had trophies. I mean, and he had his first pair of wrestling shoes. He started wrestling in the seventh grade and he, they was on his wall and he lost stuff like that. Like, all of his wrestling, I mean, he probably had hundreds and hundreds of trophies and tournaments he's won. And, you know, he, he went to the state twice and finished like fourth in the state of North Carolina wrestling. And so he lost all that stuff. He had autographed stuff by Jordan Burroughs, who's a Olympic, a Olympic wrestler. And uh, so he lost all that kind of stuff. I would say he probably lost the most stuff when it comes to memorial stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Landon, he probably, all the, um, recruiting stuff that he had, like from the different schools that was recruiting him and all, he, you know, he had a hat from every school that was recruiting him when he was in high school. He lost that kind of stuff. And, uh, both of my boys are, are, I guess they call them sneaker heads. Yeah. Like shoot, shoot. So they had tons of shoes, like, and they kept up with their shoes, like, for middle school, they still had shoes that they wore in middle school that looked brand spanking new because they would put them back in the box or in a plastic container like Kobe's and LeBron's. And so that's the kind of stuff they lost that I guess would mean the most because PlayStation 5s and stuff, we can replace all that. But my son's wrestling achievements, we can't replace that. And Landon, you know, he wrestled too in school a little bit, but most of his recruiting stuff, I would say, is what the most in their shoes uh, on Landon's side. But Quentin, he lost all his wrestling, you know, awards and stuff. So he, that's what he lost the most of. You talked about how it was a hard year for you. Also, it was a hard year for Landon, even before the uh, oh, before yeah. the fire. Uh, can we, can you yeah. maybe share some insight? Because I remember, I distinctly remember uh, interviewing him during August camp, early during camp. This past August, uh -huh. and I remember my jaw hitting the floor when he said, "Oh, I pretty much played last year with a separated shoulder." Um, can you maybe share some uh, uh -huh. sort of enlighten on go go a bit deeper into that? So, so just refresh me on. Okay, during the twenty season, did he get hurt? It, he got hurt initially in camp, and then he got. He got really hurt against Notre Dame. Is am I, is that uh -huh. is my recall correct there? Yeah, he uh he hurt it. I don't know what they call. It, I guess fall camp or yeah. spring camp. Mm -hmm. So he was hurt before the season even started. Like mm -hmm. he had a torn labrum, labrum, and his rotator cup. So he played the whole sophomore season hurt. Mm -hmm. Like the entire season, he was hurt. And I could tell it affected him uh, because I even knew he wasn't playing the way I know he can play. And he would tell me, say, Dad, I'm, I'm, 
I'm afraid to hit like I know I can hit. He said, because it hurts so bad. He said, so I got to adjust my angles. And I think he told a reporter this. You know, I got to adjust my angles and the way I pursue the ball. He said, because when it comes out, it hurts. Like, it's painful. And so he played the whole season like that. And I would talk to him after the game. He'd be disappointed. He like, you know, I'm looking like I can't play. Like, I'm not as good as I am because I'm having to – you know, compensate for my shoulder injury. And nobody knew he was hurt. Like, they we they kept it under wraps. And then in the Notre Dame game, um, the first game when he played Notre Dame, mm-hmm. he, uh, I think he hit the running back, and he said, Dad, he said, and he thought his arm fell off. He said, I thought my arm come off. He said, I couldn't feel it at all. And for, like, two weeks – he couldn't lift his arm up, you know, above to his waist or anything. Like it just hung there. And so he had some kind of like the nerve damage. And for two weeks, he, he could not move his arm. I think he set out like three weeks that three games that year. Mm-hmm. And then he got to come back with Notre Dame. And so he had surgery in the off season, but it was just like a microscopic surgery. Yeah. So, and, and what Landon, Landon's just loose jointed, you know, as they say, you know, some people are, he's just very flexible and that's his problem. He's just, he's just a flexible kid. And, um, so he had microscopic surgery and, uh, everything was good. And then in the Georgia game, you know, when he hit the running back, it just, it knocked it out the back this time. I believe it was the front, but then it knocked it out the back. So, wow. He went in and uh, so this last surgery had, I mean, it was more in depth surgery and, and it's a procedure they say a lot of NFL players get. And so they talked to me about it and, and we had other surgeons, you know, outside of Clemson look at it and stuff too. And so the Clemson surgeons and the other surgeons, they all got together and like the procedure they done this time, they said, it's the best procedure. It's going to fix it. So he will never have to worry about it again. It's going to be more painful, the recovery, but after this, he ain't going to have to worry about it no more. And so that's what they did. And like, I talked to him and he's starting to work out again. And, you know, I talked to him every night. He said, I can raise my hand up and stuff. He said, you know, it's getting stronger. He said, so I'm ready to get back out there and, and, and show the world what I got. When he hurt his shoulder initially during the preseason of 20, did he entertain the idea of shutting it down then and having surgery and, and, and sitting out the 20 season? He, he did. And I kind of told him like, Hey, you, you might want to, let's go ahead and get surgery now. And this be rich. But if you remember like uh KJ and them, uh, uh Kayvon and Tanner, you know, everybody yeah. was gone. Yeah. So they was really counting on him to be the next guy to step up. So he's like, you know what? They they kind of counting on me. You know, all our veterans are gone. You know, Nolan's still there, but most of the veterans was gone. So he's like, you know what? I'm gonna tough it out and 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 play. And that's what he done. They made him a special brace and stuff. And uh, even his um, one of his jerseys, his game jerseys that he gets to keep, uh, is so different than his freshman year jerseys. Like they put special holes in his jersey and stuff. So the scrap can come through and hold his shoulder in place. Uh-huh. So they accommodated for, you know, cause they really was, was counting on him to be that guy. And so he just said, you know what? I'm a, I'm a play dad. And you know, for the team, I'm a, I'm a suck it up. He said, it hurts like crazy, but I'm a suck it up. And he did. So when he came back this past off season after the arthroscopic surgery, was it was there a feeling that he was back to himself a hundred percent, or was it more like okay, this is a temporary, that was a temporary procedure, and I'll ultimately have to have more involved surgery? I think we kind of thought that that was it, like he was good because you know he was feeling good and um, he he worked out hard. You know he put on, I think his. Sophomore year, he weighed like 200 pounds. You know, he put on like 17 pounds to start this year out uh-huh. with this season with. And he really felt like, you know, I'm good. You know, and he just missed a lot of uh, 
spring, I believe, or fall. Yeah, it's spring. So he didn't get a lot of yeah, he didn't get a lot of practice in a lot of snaps and stuff. But you know, the, the scrimmages I went to and watched the man, he looked amazing. Mm-hmm. Like he's like, okay, he, he had to mentally get himself back to where he know he can be. And so uh, he he uh, he felt like he was a hundred percent, and it and it just wasn't. So, five, he, yeah. he felt like he was. Five sna- on the fifth snap against Georgia. The opening game is when that happened. Yes. How hard was that for him? <laughs> he was devastated. He went to the locker room and he called me because I wasn't there. I went to my oldest son game at Western, and I was watching the Clemson game on TV, like was tailgating. Mm-hmm. And I knew when he hit that guy. I could tell right away his shoulder hurt again. And he tapped his helmet. I said, yep. Mm. And he said it didn't hurt as bad this time. Like, it wasn't as bad as when he'd done it the first time in practice. So he was like, oh, we, uh, we can make it through. But then they talked about it. Like, let's go ahead and get this real procedure. Like, the, the one maybe we should have done the first time. And this is going to fix you. And so that's what he decided to do. Because he could have played, you know, but he didn't want to do another season playing half, you know, of half of what he's able to do, his abilities. Mm-hmm. He didn't want to do, he didn't want to do that again because he know his sophomore season wasn't what he's capable of doing when he has to think about taking different angles and, and every snap he's wondering, okay, you know, how am I going to get this guy to the ground without hurting my shoulder? He said, he's not, he's like, no, I'm not doing that again. So let's go ahead and get it done. I'm a rehab. And when I come back next year, then I'll be able to show everybody what Landon Zander can do. The, the fire was, I guess, three weeks, less than three weeks ago. Yep. And you have, you seem to have the perspective and peace of mind of somebody who's, maybe three years removed from such an event. Um, And I can't help, and you've obviously elaborated on the reasons behind that, being your your two boys are are safe. And um, I'm thinking to an article I read, I think it was in the Post and Courier a year or two ago when they were writing about about his hair. Um, Uh And the origin of that was... um, you took your boys when they were, I guess, in elementary school to the children's hospital and to, to, uh-huh. to bring the, the kids gifts. Um, uh-huh. And that was when he first, he, he noticed that some of them didn't have hair. Uh-huh. Uh, and that that's sort of the origin for him growing out his hair for, for locks of love. And then, mm-hmm. and then fast forwarding, I guess he, he, he his, his grandmother had breast cancer. Yes. My mother, your mother. Yes. Um, uh-huh. What what compelled you? I mean, so obviously this perspective that you have in in, in the immediate wake of such a traumatizing event is is deeply rooted. Um, and I couldn't help but think back to your decision and your the importance you placed on showing your kids, uh, an, giving your kids an appreciation for giving uh, to others. And I just wanted to maybe. I guess as we close, just sort of what what inspired you to do that to 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 take your kids to the children's hospital to to give uh, to show care and and compassion for others at, at such an early age. Uh, that's a very simple question I can answer. I grew up in South Florida, um, a single parent. My mother raised me and my three siblings. My Yes. Well, it's five of us. I'm the oldest. Mm-hmm. My father, he's deceased now, God rest his soul. He was a heroin addict. Mm. And so the situations he put us in, um, I grew up in homeless shelters. Uh, we've slept in cars. Everything I got for Christmas come from like an angel tree or somebody donating uh, a lot of our meals come from, I, I remember standing in the, they call it the government cheese line mm-hmm. to get food and stuff. 
So that's how I grew up until the age I was, I believe, 14 when we moved to the state of North Carolina. So my life in Florida, you know, we, we stayed in shelters. I love staying in shelters because they had running water, uh, electricity. They had somewhere clean to sleep, you know, food to eat. That was great to me. And, and what child should enjoy staying at a shelter? You know, yeah. that's not right. And so that's how I was. That's and and my mom did everything she could. It was it was my absent father who was a uh, you know addicted to drugs. So me going through that and and so many people helped me through Christmas trees and stuff. You know, I was a kid. I didn't know. Like I say, everything we got come from an angel tree, or you know somebody donating something. So I know what it's like to grow up without anything. And so. But when I, I got older, I knew when the Lord blessed me to have kids, I would not be the father to my kids that my dad was to me. Like, everything he wasn't to me, I was going to be to them. So I had yeah. some big shoes to fill because he was he absolutely done nothing for me. And so I wanted to let them know, okay, daddy's blessed with a, with a, with a pretty good job. It's stable. The pay's pretty good. And we, we have a decent house. You know, we didn't have a mansion. We had a three-bedroom, two-bathroom ranch-style house, like an acre of land. It, it was nothing fancy. It, it was a nice home. And, and you know, we had decent cars and stuff. And so I wanted to ins- instill in them, just because we have these things, doesn't make us better than anybody else. And I want to show you we have these things, but it's people out here that don't have these things. Like, so we would uh, go to the homeless shelter. Like, every Christmas, God placed it on my heart, I would buy Christmas for two families. And when I say Christmas, I mean whatever their kids ask for, I would purchase them. And I didn't go to an angel tree. I would tell the Lord, you know, point out who you want me to, to do for this year. And we could just be standing in a store. And God is saying, you see that man right there and that woman? That's one of them right there. And I would go up to him and and introduce myself and tell him, you know, the Lord placed this on my heart. Whatever y'all kids want for Christmas, get a list together and give it to me. And I would do that because I come from nothing. And now I'm blessed to be able to help some. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm not rich. You know, I'm I'm basically a a blue collar worker. I'm your everyday blue collar plant worker. But I know what it's like to have absolutely nothing to come from the bottom. And if God blesses me to help somebody, I'm going to do it because I believe God blesses you not to keep it, but He blesses you to bless others. You know, we got all these millionaires and billionaires out here. Why do we still have families that's homeless or hungry? Kids going without. It's not supposed to be like that. It's not intended to be like that. So that's why I've I've always raised my boys like that. We will fix meals and and go to the shelter and give it out on Thanksgiving. Um, We fix bags of stuff and and take to the homeless people under the bridge and stuff. Uh, Every time we would pass somebody, you know, you, you see the people on the streets with the signs, you know, help, you know, homeless and stuff. I had to keep a few dollars in my console because my boys, if they saw somebody, they're like, Daddy, that goes somebody needs some help. Give me some money. They like it was a point where I had to keep, you know, not a whole bunch of money, but some ones and some fives and stuff in a console because if they was in a car and somebody was holding a sign that homeless, hungry, need help, they was gonna give them some money. And I just, I just told them, like, everybody deserves a chance. And so that's why I raised my boys like that, because I've been through it. I've been there. I've been that, that kid that didn't have anything. I've been that kid that, you know, mother is struggling and, and, and we barely have any food. We, we don't have electricity for two weeks. We don't have running water for two weeks. I've been there. So I just wanted to show my kids just because – we blessed and we do have, you know, running water and electricity doesn't make you better than everybody else. 
And I just wanted to, to show them that you can never outgive God. You can never outgive God. And that's how I raise them. And, and they still like that to this day. I, I remember Landon got an award one time at elementary school. And when his teacher told me why he got this award, I cried like a mm. baby in front of everybody because she said it was a little boy in that class. I guess he come from a, 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 you know, a home that was financially struggling and stuff. And this little boy, you know, she said he would smell like pee and urine and stuff. And he would wear the same clothes every day. And she said, nobody in that class would play with that little boy, would talk to that little boy. They treated him like an outcast. She said, but your son, Landon Zanders, plays with him every hmm. day. They go out on the playground. They're playing. When it comes time to partner up, Landon goes over there and he partners up with that little boy. And man, that, that hmm. broke me down. I'm like... I, I I told him that, it, it, yeah. you know, it, it made me realize that sometimes you think what you're teaching your kids, they're not getting it. But then it's something like that. that shows you, Hey, they getting it. And he got some kind of big award for that because his teacher said, Landon plays with that little boy every day. She said, it's the most precious things I've ever seen in my life. As long as I've been teaching. And so that's how, that's, that's how I, I, I raised my boys. With, with that mindset. That's why they do what they do. So they, they ain't know. perfect now. They not perfect, but they some pretty good kids. Like I told you in the beginning of this, man, I, I, I like, God, why, why you bless me with these amazing boys? Sometimes they get on my nerves and I want to <laughs> strangle them. But at the end of the day, man, they are, for the most part, man, they are awesome kids. They are really awesome. Is there, but that, that's that's how I raise them. Yeah, and I guess and they, I guess they're well versed on. Uh, you've told them your story, your background, and all the stuff you overcame. Oh yeah, they know. I, I told them. You know, they know exactly what I went through and and why I work so hard and and you know why I do the things I do. Why I try to help whenever I can help. And, and when this house fire thing happened, I was going to turn down every bit of help. I guess because. I don't know if it was a pride thing or because um, I still got a job and I can still make ends meet. You know, my pastor come to me and he, he uh, gave me a check. I was like, pastor, I'm, I'm good. Like, we're going to make, and he's like, no. He said, as much as you help people, when you, when it's time for you to get help, receive it. Don't block the blessings God has given you. And I was going to like, no go for me pay. I was like, I don't want none of that stuff. But my pastor, like, Linda, you always helping somebody. Allow God to help you. And so I did. It, it was hard for me to allow this, but but when I did, it touched my heart. Like the Clemson parents, I I probably text uh, KJ's mom and and Jamie's mom like a hundred times, just thanking them, like, because it blew me away. Like these people don't really know me because. Like I say, I kind of sit in the back. I don't, I don't socialize a whole lot. I'm a very sociable person. I just, I don't know many other parents. And my son's been there three years. I know a handful of them. And and the ones that didn't know me, they reached out and they blessed us with gift cards and prayers and and money. It it blew me away that them people that don't even know nothing about me love me enough to take up something to help me out. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, the, the example that you set in, in, in physically taking your, your boys to homeless shelters and hospitals, you know, it's, I mean, I think all parents tell their kids, you know, you need to, appreciate what you have and there are others who are much less fortunate but we don't take the ac the action of it's so easy hey go to a soup kitchen on thanksgiving take yes, it there it's simple. And there's and nothing keeping so there's nothing keeping you from from doing that and i include myself yeah there's nothing keeping us from doing that uh and that is so man it's so meaningful in so many ways uh to to have 
to be able to do that, not just for your children, but for you, you know? Um, yeah. So what a, what an admirable, um, foundation that, that you built based on your own experiences and, uh, a wonderful example. Um, is there anything, well, first of all, the GoFundMe, is there, are there anything important that people need to know, uh, as far as where to go to, um, I think Miss Lisa Jackson, uh, like I said, it was two of them. A company set up one that reached 10,000, then they, you know, they disabled it. But then my sister set up one, and I think it says, my baby sister, um, it says, helping the Xanders rebuild. And I think I I texted to Miss Lisa, and she was going to put it on your on your site. Right. Yeah. And it's okay. just, like, it's, 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 I am going to have to come out of pocket some. And, you know, I do got to replace everything of my kids. And I started, you know, last week with my oldest son replacing all his winter clothes and stuff. So that's what the GoFundMe is for. Um, and I appreciate everybody that has donated something. I mean, it just comes to show you that, man, we still have a chance yeah. to turn this thing around in life about loving each other. And, and I just want to say this. We are all God's children. No matter if you're black, white, pink, orange, or green, we are all God's children, and we all should love each other and 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 stop so much hatred. And and you got the lefts and you got the rights. You got the vaccinated and unvaccinated. Who cares? I love you. I can care less. I love you. If I had a dollar for every time I said I love you, I'd probably be a billionaire. <laughs> because I, that's one of the greatest words in the world is to say, I love you. And sometimes strangers would be like, it makes them uncomfortable, <laughs> but hey, I love you. I love you. I mean, right now, I love you. It, it's an amazing word. So, you know, I, I appreciate the, the love and support I've gotten from everybody you know, losing my home. But like I said, I'm not sad. I have two amazing kids that made it out and I can hug on Landon Zanders and, and, you know, kiss on him and, and, and joke with him. You know, I sent them a song. Uh, old school is like, a uh, man, who sung that song? It was like, uh, a fire song. You know, and he said oh, the, the meters like uh, yes. the fire on a bayou. Yeah, and uh, he said he, I talked to him last night. Me, him, and his brother was on Facetime, and I was like, "Land, you come home this weekend?" He said, "I don't know, Dad." He said, "I might come home." I said, "Oh, my bad. You ain't got a home to come home to. You burned it down. Remember?" <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "He was like, Dad, that's not funny. Too soon." He said, "Yeah, that's not <laughs> funny." But you know, I, I, I keep it. You know, I try to make him realize that, man, yeah, the house is burnt down, but baby, I still love you. This changes nothing about the way I feel for you. And after that house fire, I, I text both of my boys and I told them, I said, there's nothing you can ever do in your life to ever make me not love you or to turn my back on you. I don't care what it is. I will always love you until the day I die. You will always be my kids and I will always love you. And we as parents need to tell our kids that. No matter what you do or, or, or who you decide to be, I'm going to love you. I may not agree with it. It may upset me. It may, may make me feel some type of way, but I'm going to always love you. And parents need to let the kids know that. We need to be our kids' uh, superhero. We need to be their role model. We don't need somebody in the, in the Hollywood industry to be their superhero. I want to be my kid's superhero. And that's how they look at me. I'm, I'm their superhero. I'm just a, a normal guy. But to them, I'm their Superman. And I love that. What a wonderful conversation, Lindell. I appreciate you you uh, sharing so much of your time. I know a lot of listeners are going to get a lot out of this and really gain a, a greater appreciation for, for, for the things that are that are really important in life yes sir that's what it's about inspirational stuff there from Lindell Zanders appreciate him taking some time out of his surely busy schedule to be with us 
Also, very much appreciate the support of our seven sponsors for helping make this happen. Most of all, thanks to all of you for hitting play every week. Everybody be safe and have a wonderful weekend. Cheers. Cheers.